uh, some of our upcoming things uh, for everybody. We're audience is a little bit smaller tonight. I, I think the weather was a little too good. Yeah. <laughs> everybody. Well, no kind of deals, but uh, we do have some things coming up. Um, the uh, I was trying to kind of tune this a little bit toward y'all. Uh, the uh, some of the things that we have coming up is more Civil War. Uh, it's uh, one of our newer series. Uh, actually, we're going to start next with next Thursday, and it's basically a, a YouTube film followed by a discussion. And uh, I, I kind of kind of a video and a chat, but it's really kind of a video and then a show and tell from our stuff. Okay. Uh, some of the things we have here in the archives. Which uh, next Thursday is going to be Civil War Voices, records from the National Archives and a personal collection. And this is one of the uh, historians at the National Archives and, and uh, tell them about some of the diaries and things like that that they have at the National Archives. And then some, I was going to bring down some of the uh, diaries and things we have here at our archives. The, uh, then after that, um, on October 5th, which is the following Thursday, uh, Jesse Skiles, who is the coach for West Virginia Wesley and uh, for several of his sports up there, will present DuPont High School football. I don't know if we have any DuPont High School or Riverside or you know, where all, all the schools have been combined now, but, uh, but he, he's the coach. He's actually a world-class coach in, uh, in the uh, sports that he covers there. Uh, the following Thursday, Documenting Death in the Civil War. And that's another one of the YouTube, uh, followed by a, a discussion and some of the things we have as far as uh, with the militia units and things in, in the Civil War. Uh, the Union uh, militia units that, that would have been in the counties and things. Some of them document a little bit. Some of the uh, action reports tell a little bit about uh, the, the death and things. Then after that, October 19th, Civil War Medicine and Surgery. Ooh, that sounds fun. Yeah, uh, the, uh, there's a series of books we have over on, on our uh, library shelf there. It tells a little bit about some of the instruments and things like that. And, and uh, of course, uh, the, the, uh, one of the Civil War soldiers, I'm trying to remember his first name, but his hanger was his last name. He was the one that, uh, as far as uh, prosthetics for Civil War soldiers, he, He's the one that, that really brought that. Since he himself was a Civil War soldier and had been injured, and, and he developed some prosthetics. And the surgery part and things is kind of gruesome. Well, you know, whiskey and salves. Yeah, the yeah. yeah, salves and things like that. It's, it's, it's pretty rough. But, yes. but uh, anyway, tonight, Carter Taylor Seaton will present The Rebel and the Red Jeep, The Life of Ken Heckler. Ken Heckler, of course, many things in West Virginia. Uh, the, uh, there's so many, so many that I've seen just in my life. And then before that, as far as congressman, uh, secretary of state, you know, so many things. And before that, a war hero, and World War II hero that just, my gosh, when you think of all the things that he'd done, it's <laughs> pretty impressive. But tonight, Carter will discuss her latest book, The Rebel and the Red Jeep, Ken Heckler's Life in West Virginia Politics. Chronicling the life of Ken Heckler, who passed away at the age of 102, having led a full life of service to his nation, state, and community, Heckler served in the U.S. House of Representatives from 1959 to 1977, and was West Virginia Secretary of State from 1985 to 2001. Among his other accomplishments, he wrote The Bridge at Remagen, The Amazing Story of March 7, 1945, the day that the Rhine River was crossed, first published in 1957. Carter is author of two novels, Father's Troubles and An Unconventional Love Story, and two nonfiction books, Hippie Homesteaders, Arts, Crafts, Music, and Living on the Land in West Virginia, and of course, The Rebel and the Red Jeep. She holds the Tamarack Foundation Fellowship Award for Lifetime Achievement in the Arts and the West Virginia Library Association honored her with the 2014 WVLA Literary Merit Award. Marshall University's College of Liberal Arts honored her with an award of distinction in 2015. 
and she received the Governor's Award for Lifetime Achievement in the Arts in 2016. Please welcome her. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, what I'm going to talk about is not Ken's accomplishments or the things that he has done, although they are varied and many and illustrious. Um, I'm going to tell some of the kind of backstories of Ken. I, I tried in this book not to just be a documentarian or a journalist reciting his accomplishments and the things he'd been involved in, but instead I sought to try and make Ken Ken, make him a human being make him the person that was kind of the backside of what his personal persona was. Um, you know, if you grew up during that time frame or if you've studied any of the history of our state and politics and so forth, you know that Ken was, as uh, Randy said, a number of things in, in government as well as uh, before government. And he, um, he was either revered by those who supported him and absolutely loved him, or he was reviled by those who opposed his ideas on coal mine safety and strip mining and mountaintop removal and a number of things like that. Um, it, it was a different time when Ken served in Congress, and he was one of those congressmen who was really single-minded about what he could do for his state and the people that he served rather than being involved in every other committee and every other issue in the nation, he wanted to serve West Virginians. And um, I think he did that. He signed every letter he ever wrote as you're serving in Congress. And that was his motto and the one he wanted to be remembered. Um, so I'm going to take you back to his early childhood and try and tell you a little bit about what made Ken Ken. This is Ken in his mother's lap in 19, probably 15, maybe 16. He looks like he's maybe 18 months old. Chubby little fella, uh, not the handsomest of the three brothers. He thinks the one with his dad was the handsomest. But um, he grew up in a very unusual set of circumstances. He grew up behind the iron gates of an estate owned by a man named Clarence Mackey on Long Island in Roslyn, New York. And one of the things that he loved to do was to pick his mother's flowers and go sell them to the neighbors with his buddy Billy Letson, which of course got him into a lot of trouble. But those were his only uh, playmates, were the kids who lived on the estate. Um, Mackey had hired his father as the superintendent of the whole estate. A 682-acre estate. The, the house was as large as the Parthenon in Greece. And it resembled the Biltmore Hotel. I mean, the Biltmore House in North Carolina. Clarence lost all his money in the Depression, and eventually the house was torn down. But the gates still are there. It's now become a, 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 a subdivision. The Ken left there when he was in uh, ready to go to college, um, but he was he had such a, a great beginning. His mother had been a school teacher, and she taught all of the boys uh, to read, to do math, and um, before they went to school, they could do that. They were extremely prolific in terms of their uh, educational background. And one of the books that she read him all the time was about um, heroes in the, in the United States. It was called Builders of Our Country. And he listened to these stories of how people had provided service to our country when he was you know, literally 45 years old. Um, in school, he, he didn't have the best um, rapport with people, shall we say, because he had a terrible inferiority complex. And part of the reason was because he would help his dad's uh, staff milk the cows before he went to school. But without um, benefit of a second bath, he smelled like sour milk when he got there. And so he couldn't attract the girls. Most of the boys didn't want to have anything to do with him. He was pretty bookish. He wore glasses and was very studious. And 
not at all athletic, and they made fun of him in the Boy Scouts, and he just had a real inferiority complex by the time, particularly by the time he got to high school. He had had one girlfriend on the estate that he was just crazy about when she, he was young, and she was the daughter of a Polish immigrant who worked on the estate, and his father forbade him to see this girl because he thought the Poles were beneath his status. So his father was, and mother were both pretty prejudiced, so Ken realized somehow as a young man that that was wrong, and he immediately set out and he was to, to change his own attitude, and he was extremely in opposition to his parents on many, many issues. So following high school, he left Roslyn and went to Swarthmore, which is in Pennsylvania, and he figured that it was far enough away from his parents that he could do what he wanted to, but close enough to go home and get a good cooked meal if he needed to, and get his clothes washed. But that wasn't often, because he got very interested in um, democratic politics while he was there. His parents were Republicans, very staunch Republicans who worked on the Republican committee in the county, and her, his mother was an organizer for the county Republican Party and thought that all the people who worked there on the estate ought to register as Republicans, and they would be loyal to the party. And so when he went to Swarthmore and he wrote his mother and he said he was going to become a Democrat, she said, and I quote, you can become a damn Democrat if you want to, just don't discuss politics when you come home. I don't <laughs> like bickering. <laughs> so also, they were so ambitious for their three boys and the oldest one um, was very, very bright. The, Ken was as well, but they were always jealous of each other because uh, it was always a competition. His parents wanted them all to be uh, very ambitious, and their admonition, particularly his mother's, was that if you got involved with girls, they were an abomination, and they would be an albatross around your neck. I find that really strange for a mother to say to a son, but it really tainted Ken's attitude, and he just didn't, he shied away from girls. On top of the fact that he had trouble relating to them when he was young, he just didn't quite know how to, um, how to make small talk and how to dance. He didn't learn to dance until he was in college. So um, it, it wasn't easy for him. So he, he, his father wanted him to be a business major, major, and he took that for maybe a semester and said he couldn't handle it, and he switched to political science. And there he encountered a professor named Robert Brooks who took him under his wing and taught him not only how to study, but gave him a whole lot of self-confidence, which he well deserved because he was a very, very smart man. Um, and he, this guy had one class in which he challenged the class to say exactly what would be the first thing they would do if they ever decided to run for office. And Ken said immediately, the first thing he would do is change his name to Ken from Kenneth, which is what they would call him by then, because he said Kenneth sounded like what his mother would admonish him with when he didn't clean out the ring in the bathtub. <laughs> and he just thought it was too formal. So anytime I ever talked to Ken, the first time I ever met him, I called him, you know, Dr. Hecker, and he said, now call me Ken. And he always wanted everyone to call him that, regardless of what their station was and what his was. So um, after he graduated from Swarthmore, he went on to get his master's degree and then his doctorate from Columbia University. And in 1939, he taught both at Columbia and at his sister school, Barter. Um, and he introduced this device for teaching. And I like to call it Skype without the visuals. He set up an amplifying system, which you can see there in the back, and, and had a telephone line run to his classrooms, and he would call people in government, both state and national, business scions, and anybody that he thought would provide good information for his classroom. And then the students could hear, could ask questions, and hear the answers. 
and it was the most lively class on any of the campuses where he ever did that. Um, several organizations adopted such a thing, and one college did too, after he had introduced it because they thought it was so innovative. He also invited people to his classroom, and when they couldn't come, then he used the telephone system. He, one year he decided that he needed to invite all of the heads of the political parties, and that included the Communist Party. So he invited Earl Browder, who was then the president of the uh, Communist Party, and it got him into big trouble with the dean because they said he couldn't bring, her, bring him to Columbia's campus. Well, he said, I won't. I promise I won't. But instead, he took him to Barnum. So <laughs> he was pretty sneaky about anything that he could get away with like that. Um, when World War II began, Ken was working with a man named Sam Rosenman. He was a judge, a federal judge, and he had been compiling Franklin Roosevelt's papers. Now, these were the things that were not his regular speeches, but his off-the-cuff comments or his um, quick little press conferences, things that necessarily wouldn't have had a script, just would have had notes. And he and, and he asked Ken, he hired Ken, and it's involved as to how he got to know it, it was through someone in the class, um, and asked him if he would be interested in, in working with him to do this. And ultimately, they um, compiled and published five volumes of FDR's papers, and Ken was instrumental in helping to do that. He decided that he didn't want to enlist. He said he would rather be drafted for the Second World War because he wanted to um, get to know the, the rank and file. And I think the political office bug must have bitten him back in college because when you look back, even though he never really admitted it, you could see things he did that would ensure that sooner or later he'd be on the campaign trail. And working with the, um, the draftees instead of being an enlisted man was one of them. He was convinced that that was the best way to go because he hadn't really known a lot of just people who lived in the community where he was where he grew up. The only trouble was um, he did get drafted after Pearl Harbor because they lowered the um, the, the requirements for uh, your, for health, but you still had to take the eye exam. And he knew he was going to fail because, as you can see, he wears glasses and had for most of his life. So he stood in the back. And he read that Harry Truman did the same thing. So he stood in the back and memorized the eye chart while everybody else took it. And then when he got up there, he passed it with flying colors. So, <laughs> yeah, always, a, always a way. Um, he went to Fort Knox, and he was being trained as a tank commander. Uh, he was going to drive a tank. And he had signed up for that, or he'd been hoping for that instead of the infantry because he knew that that was a death sentence. So he thought doing a tank would be better until he ran into a commander who said that Ken didn't have the killer instinct and that he wouldn't be any good on it as a tank commander. And so they realized that he'd written some parodies and put on a, a kind of a uh, show for the, for the uh, army brass uh, at his graduation at Fort Knox, and they decided that he was so smart that they would rather use him in some other fashion. So they drafted him into being a war historian. So what his job was, was to go to every battle after it had occurred all over Europe and document what had gone on. So he interviewed both the commanders, the enlistees, the draftees, the and even the army officers in the other, on the other side, the Germans, if he could get hold of one of them and sit and talk to them. And it was about the strategies. And the idea was that they were compiling information to use in the war colleges for future fighting, future wars. Um, he, that's where he first drove the tank. And he decided that that was a pretty cool piece of equipment. He got to where he needed to go in Germany. Uh, but he covered everything from Normandy to the Battle of the Bulge, and then, of course, he was at the Bridge of Romani um, just at that time, just right after the bridge finally was captured. You meant a jeep, didn't you? That, what did I say? Tank. 
Oh, I would have been good too. But G, he was he was asked in one place to go into the town and find sleeping quarters for, um, or not find sleeping quarters, but see if he could get some mattresses and things like that for his troops because all their supplies hadn't come. And he knocked on one door and he thought his high school friends would carry him through. And he asked for what he thought were mattresses and the woman slammed, his, slammed the door in his face because he heard later that he had asked for a mistress. <laughs> <laughs> His high school friends didn't quite work. He also ran into Patton one time, to no, no good for him. He was in uh, Nor on the Normandy coast, and Patton arrived in camp. And they were being, um, at that time, they were covering up all of the, anything shiny in the, on their uniforms or on the tanks or wherever that would uh, catch the light. And they were using a, a substance called cosmoline, which is a brownish, waxy stuff. And he had it all over, smeared all over his hat, all over his shoulders and other good stuff. And Patton got really offended. And he came up to him, to all of them were like that, and he said, are you all proud of your rank? And, and you know, came sort of stammered and said, yeah, yes, sir, I am. And he said, well, then take that damn stuff off or I'm taking your rank away from you. So they hung him off and washed the things, and then after he left, they put him back on, like they were supposed to. So after the war, he taught at Princeton for a little while. And oh, one more thing he did while he was in the war. Um, after the war ended, his next assignment, rather than getting to go home, was to go to um, a place called Mondorf, which was in, um, in Germany. And it was the place where they had housed all of the Nazi war criminals before they took them to Nuremberg for trial. And his job was to interview all of them again about their fighting tactics, the strategies, and so forth. Not about not about the camps at all. And he interviewed everybody from um, Goring on down that was there at that camp. And um, he, I asked him why, how did he manage to? talk to these people, knowing what he knew, because he had seen uh, Buchenwald before he left, before he got off the battlefield, after they lived a little bit. And um, he said, I just had to put it out of my mind and only deal with the questions at hand, because I knew they would shut down and never say another word to me if I, if I mentioned it. So he thought that was a plum um, assignment. And lots of people put it down and didn't want to deal with it, and he did it. So he taught at Princeton for a little while, I think maybe two years, but he couldn't stand it. He wanted to get back into government. He's always vacillated between teaching and government, teaching and government. Even through uh, the 80s, he came here, to, came back to West Virginia, of course, and, and he taught at Marshall in the 80s and early 90s. So he, he really wanted to work for Truman. That, that guy was his idol, basically. So he talked to Judge Rosenman again, and he begged him to try and find him a job. Well, he started off, finally, it took him a while, but he finally got a job as a research assistant. And um, that meant that he was to do all kinds of research on any place that Truman was going to go, particularly on some of these whistle stop tours and learn about the town, the politics there, the problems there, so that when Truman went, he sounded like he knew everything there was to know about that community. Um, and Ken loved to say something about his trips to Key West with Truman, but he finally admitted to me that he'd actually only been there once. <laughs> and this is where it was. He's sitting there on Truman Beach, and he's the man holding Truman the um, the, what do you call this thing? Life, life preserver. Yeah, he's holding the life preserver. But it was a weekend where a lot of important people were there, uh, including one of the Supreme Court justices. Um, uh, and he, uh, it was a Thanksgiving weekend, and he um, he was there walking on the beach with him and so forth. And it was right before Truman decided not to run the second time. 
So, where's, where's Ken and where's Truman? Well, Truman's the guy with the uh, dapper scarf around his neck and the pith helmet looking up. Yeah. And Ken is the one holding the life preserver. I got you. Okay. In the sunglasses and the life preserver. He almost looks like FDR with a, it almost looks like a cigarette cutter. Uh -huh. <laughs> he does, yeah. So, uh, you know, when Truman left the White House uh, after Eisenhower won, as most presidents do, they meet very graciously, they leave notes and all this kind of stuff. Well, Ken's office was in the executive, old executive office building, and he didn't leave. He decided, somebody asked him, it was just sort of a joke. Somebody said, well, so what are you going to do tomorrow? He said, I'm going to go to work. And they said, you're kidding. He said, no, I'm not I'm coming to work. So he was working on something that was ultimately called the Hyplopedia which was a compendium of every blooper and every ill-advised remark that Eisenhower had ever made on the campaign trails. And Truman had asked him to compile this. Well, it ultimately turned into a 600-page book, and he assembled it on the floor of the bowling alley in the White House. <laughs> so <laughs> so he, um, he decided to just stay. And uh, every day he went back to his office, and every day he went over to the White House mess and ate lunch with everybody. And he said they were all high five and slapping each other on the back, you know, about being in office now. And, and uh, he didn't let on that he was not. And um, so they'd say, Well, what do you do? And he'd say, Well, I, I, I do research. Oh, research is important. We really need research. That's great. Good for you. So then they cut back on the number of people who could go. They, only, they had to be GS-12s or higher. Well, Ken's name was still on the list when they sent him out. So he kept on going. One day he was sitting at lunch with everybody, and someone said, who, who do you work for? And Ken said, I work for the special counsel. And from the end of the table, a little voice came and said, I'm the special counsel. What is it you do for me? <laughs> <laughs> you know, whoops, once he was once he was found out it was over. But he decided that he, he really detested Richard Nixon. And so Richard Nixon was of course the vice president at this point and he detested the man. He knew about some of the dirty politics he pulled out in California and he just didn't like him and he wanted out of Washington in the worst way. So he took a job after he left uh, the White House finally, uh, with an the, the American Political Science Association. And his job was to, one of his jobs was to vet professors for political science positions in universities. So one day, a letter came in and it said, it was from Marshall College, saying that we need somebody for one semester to fill a place where a sabbatical is going to occur. And instead of sending the three names that Ken usually sent, he sent his own and decided that that was you know, what he wanted to do. Now, of course, he knew Huntington well. He'd been here when he was on leave once for Fort Knox. He'd researched it for Truman, and he knew that it was probably a good spot to go. Also, he was friends with Justice Brandeis, who said, you need to be working in the boondocks for the people, not in this fishbowl of Washington, D.C. So he took that up and decided to go. So he was there for just one semester, but his, of uh, one year, but his reputation was so enormous on campus that people will swear to me that they had his class in years that he wasn't even there. Um, he became so well known on campus. And one of the tricks he used to do that was to go around the room at the beginning of every class, and this was a required class for freshmen coming into Marshall, Political Science 101. He would ask them their name, he said, tell me your name, where you're from, and how you like your coffee. And the classroom would usually be 40 people because it was a required freshman class. And so they would tell him, and on the following Wednesday, which is when the class next met, he would send Michael Perry, who became uh, the, the bank president and president of Marshall at one time, and owned Heritage Farm out in Heritage. Out in, in, uh, no, he wasn't Michael. Oh, well. uh, Mike was the um, was the assistant to this this political science department's 
professors. He sent him over to a restaurant across the street from Marshall and had him get big gallons, big containers of coffee and cream and sugar and so forth. And he brought it back on Wednesday and when they all walked into their 8 o'clock class, he said, sit wherever you want to. And then he would call their name, mention where they were from, something about their town, and pour them the cup of coffee as they had ordered it without writing down a single word. And he rarely missed, according to Mike, and he did this with all these classes, rarely missed. So he was beloved on campus, and he knew their names so well that he would say their names out on campus, and he would say to them, you know, how are things going in Huntington? How are things going in, you know, Crum, wherever it was they were? And they really became enamored of him. This is one of his classes, and there are some people there that if you're from Charleston, you might recognize the guy between the bus driver and Ken. That's David Hayden. I don't know if you know that name or not, but he's here in Huntington, here in Charleston. Came from Huntington, all the high school with him. And several other people in there that I know that are, you know, for Huntingtonians. But he took a class to Marsh, of Marshall students, and they had to write an essay in order to get on the bus. He took them to Washington to show them how things are done in Washington. Took tours of the Capitol and so forth. And that is one of the things that kind of became later when he became a congressman, his Week in Washington program. And that's really where it started, was taking this class up there. Um, the Week in Washington was geared towards juniors in high school. And it was uh, to show them how, how government worked and so forth. And they'd spent a whole week in Washington. So the story about him coming to, to Huntington, um, he, he always sort of put that down as just a good coincidence, not something that was really planned. But Simon Perry, who was a professor of political science at Marshall, also had another story, and that was that Ken had um, planned it so that he, he'd gone out and he'd done all sorts of research on places that might be friendly to a liberal, friendly to a newcomer, uh, someplace where the incumbent was possibly vulnerable and was older. Well, he beat a man named Will Neal, who had been our congressman in the 4th District for years and years and years, and was about 84 years old. His campaign slogan was, and he was a doctor, uh, his campaign slogan was, I delivered you, now you deliver for me. But Ken beat the socks off of him, and he never lost an election for the next nine elections, 18 years he served. And the last two times, no one would even run against him because he, uh, he, was, he was unbeatable, literally. And, uh, Were there other communities on the short list when he picked West Virginia? Not that I'm aware of. Not that I'm aware of. He had, I think there might have been, but apparently from what they said, he knew enough about Huntington that, and he'd been here at least twice, so he thought it was a good spot to come. Amazing, isn't it? His campaign style was really unusual for the time. Um, in, instead of you know, doing political speeches and handing out buttons and bumper stickers and gimmicks like that, he went door to door, farm to farm, factory to factory, and shook hands with everybody. And he traded his convertible, which he bought when he first came here, traded it in on a red jeep. And he decided that the red jeep was something that he, you know, would get him wherever it needed to go in West Virginia. And uh, being red would attract a whole lot of attention. And subsequently, he had five disciples, five red jeeps throughout his life. And he said in that first campaign, he drove 14,000 miles. And this is in one district, the fourth district, but didn't include very many counties at the time, and wore out four pairs of shoes walking. It also didn't hurt that his book, The Bridget Bridget Lenoggin, had come out that year before. And he went places and he would take cases. Bobby Nelson told me this story. He was his campaign manager. Um, and he was a student. He had just graduated from Marshall. So he used all kinds of young people to go campaign with him. 
never paid a poll worker, never paid anybody. And he always used volunteers, no staff at all. Um, he put cases and cases and cases of books in that Jeep, and then he would take them to the uh, places like um, the aluminum plant in Ravenswood, the nickel plant in Huntington, and hand these books out to people as they came and went, and just say, you know, hi, I'm Ken Heckler, I'm running for fourth district congressman. And by the time it was over, he was going after what he called the un, um, the un, how do you say it? The people who didn't normally vote, non-historical voters. Will Neal was going after the people who had always voted and always voted for him. He decided that there were enough people who might vote, might not vote, that he could change things. So he went after what he called the non-historical voter. And, and people voted for him, even if they weren't Democrats, because they began to believe that he was their friend. And you'd certainly vote for your friend, but old Ken Heckler, he came up to my farm and saw me. I was out, you know, harvesting tobacco. He came to see me. I'm voting for him. So he made himself you know, close to the people and made them think that he really was one of them and cared about them. His, his, of course, he did get the, um, you know, the carpet bag tag hang, hung on him, and he used to say, well, I wasn't born in West Virginia, but I got here as quickly as I could. <laughs> so when Ken got to Congressman, got to Congress in 1959 as a freshman class, he was dubbed by a Washington Post columnist as one of the most eligible people in the group. Um, but he, he, she said that he would add brains to any day, dinner table chit chat. He established an office which became sort of a model for all the rest of his offices forever. And if you ever went in Ken's office, you know what I'm talking about. It was stacked sky high with papers. He rarely filed anything and took the, his staff weeks to get anything filed and he wouldn't let them bother anything in his own private office and instead if you asked him for something he'd say yeah i've got it just a minute and he'd reach down in this stack of papers and pull out exactly what you asked for he, he was remarkable in that fashion he knew exactly where he had put everything um, he was asked he asked to serve on the currency and banking committee thinking that that would really be of help to the distressed areas of West Virginia, but they didn't put him on that, and instead he was put on the very first committee for the Space Age. He was put on the original, um, it's called, it was called, it's had several different names, but it was called Space and Technology Committee. And as you can see right here, he's with Werner von Braun inspecting one of the rockets that was going to go up. It was right at the beginning of the space race, right after Sputnik had gone up, and Kennedy had said we were going to you know, put a man on the moon in 10 years. And um, he was in Congress at that time, and he was put on that committee. And that's one of the few things he doesn't ever talk about, because that wasn't something that he thought was going to help West Virginians at all. It did give him oversight of the Green Bank Observatory, but that was such a minus, minuscule part of what he did that uh, it all got overshadowed by the space race. And he just didn't feel that that was important. And I don't know that this is even possible now, but instead of spending his energy on that, although he did what he was supposed to do, and he sub sub chaired he chaired subcommittee. He spent his time working to get federal legislation for the Mine Health and Safety Act. And that was his biggest push the entire 18 years he was in Congress. He considers that his, his signature achievement and it gave the coal miners in this country and their widows their black lung benefits. And of the 750 boxes of papers that are at the Marshall Library, over 40 of them are filled with letters to and from miners and their families about that issue. He spent countless hours and slept little trying to get that bill passed. Now he's with uh, Jacques Yablonsky right there looking at the bill. 
uh, trying to get you know, markups and so forth for it before it went out to Congress. And he traveled with Yablonsky a number of different times. Uh, and in later, later after Yablonsky died, he found out that he was also a marked man. He was a target. And they would have shot him just as quickly as they did Yablonsky if they could have gotten a clean shot at him when he was out traveling around because they were so, the, the Tony Boyle's men were so incensed about this whole idea. And of course, Boyle's henchmen all went to jail, and so did he um, for killing Yablonsky, his wife, and his daughter. And um, many years later, after Ken finally dropped out of politics, Claude, Claude Bailey, who was one of the murderers, wrote a letter to Ken and he was glad and he said he was glad to see his, his ass was finally not taking any more money from the public trough. <laughs> he, he hated him as much as Ken hated, hated them. So um, the other thing that he did when he was in Congress, which got very little publicity, was to go to Selma and march with Martin Luther King. He's the only congressman who did so, ever. And he was supposed to be going on another shot, uh, another junket to take Canaveral for a moon shot or some kind of a, a rocket shot. And he decided to not go. He decided to go instead to Birmingham and walk with King. But he wanted, he, he only stayed the weekend and he did march about halfway, I guess. Well, he marched a day, and it took him five days to get to Selma. But he came back because he um, cherished his voting record so much that he wanted to be here for that for a vote on some bill. And this is Carl Albert presenting him with a, a gavel and a, a commentary about his 2,500 2, straight vote. He he only missed one vote in his entire career, and that was during the Watergate hearings. He was home watching the hearings on television, and they uh, brought a bill up very late at night. And he didn't have a telephone because he was so frugal. And so all his staff had gone home, and nobody could come over and get him and tell him that he was needed back to capital to vote. And that's the one vote he missed. In 1975, uh, as most congressmen do in the summer, they all took their junkets and took vacations and took off. And Ken was upset about that because there was legislation pending that he thought was extremely important. And instead, they postponed it and took off anyway. So he said, well, this summer, I'm going to work for the people while you all are all playing. So he advertised among his constituents and in every town in his district that he would work for free for anybody who wanted to hire him. So he did everything from castrating pigs to mowing grass at the settlement in Huntington. This is a Stella Fuller playground in Huntington. He delivered newspapers, picked up garbage in Jaeger, um, just unbelievable things that, that you and I would never do, and things that he had never had. A, I mean, he's ne he never worked with his hands in his entire life um, until he did this. And um, he said castrating the pigs was probably the hardest thing to do. <laughs> probably he didn't like the way they squeal. But he also worked with the state hospital. He worked with the elderly and the, uh, um, you know, the, there, of course, that's a state hospital. Then was was uh, a pretty dismal place to be, and he worked with the elderly patients there. He only, one person, said that they absolutely insisted that they pay him and they wanted to pay him what he was worth. And this was the newspaper editor in Yeager for develop to, to, to deliver the newspapers. He paid him twelve dollars and fifty cents. So in in uh, a few years later, after after he left Congress, and he left Congress because he wanted to run for governor only mostly because he wanted to argue with Jay Rockefeller about mountain, about strip mining. And nobody would argue with him in Congress because they weren't, nobody was debating him, and nobody was running against him. So he dropped out and ran for governor. And he announced it from over here in the, the, the guard hut at the governor's mansion. 
called the press together and sat in the garden and announced announced he was going to run for governor. What year is that? Uh, 75, I guess. Um, no, it must have been after that, 77, 76, 77. The election was in 78. Maybe it was, it must have been after 77, so 78. Um, well, of course, he got beaten. Jay won $12 million in the coffers and, and won, won the election. So he sat out for a little while. He taught again at the University of uh, Charleston. And then he ran for Secretary of State. He just couldn't stand not being in government again. So he ran for Secretary of State. And he wanted to use that as his slogan. But he was, uh, finally he asked advice from somebody, which he hadn't done when he was run, decided to run for, for governor. And they thought that was probably not a good idea. <laughs> but he did win, and he was reelected four different times. Now, most of us think of the Secretary of State as maybe not being a very um, influential job. We, we may all remember uh, a James Mansion who, you know, spent most of his time, you know, hauling cars out of creeks and making flowery speeches. But Ken did several things having to do with the election laws that made a big difference. The first thing he did was to increase the distance between the polling place and where. Um, where you could pass out campaign material from 50 feet, which is literally right outside the door, to 300 feet. So that's why when you go to vote today, there's nobody out there trying to influence your vote as you walk up and down the sidewalk. While he was Secretary of State, he also took on walking with this lady across the country. Her name is Granny D. Her name was Doris Haddock. She decided, uh, she heard about the uh, McCain, McCain final law that was the bill that was trying to be passed about ca uh, campaign finance reform. I knew that it really never got where it was supposed to go and didn't pass like it should have, and it's, that was still a big issue. And so she decided to try and draw attention to that. She lived in uh, New Hampshire, and she set out to walk all the way across the country from Pasadena to the steps of the Washington Capitol to draw attention to this issue. So Ken heard about her, and he decided to join her. So as Secretary of State, whenever he had a free weekend or a free week, he met Granny D along the way and marched a total of 584 miles across the country with her to campaign for finance reform. Um, and he trained to do that by carrying a backpack of 10, 20 pounds you know, for, and he would walk 10 miles at a time to make sure he could do this. Granny wasn't so sure because he was 84 years old. Well, she was 89. <laughs> <laughs> but they, and he, she actually completed it in her, in her 90th year. And they marched together a number of different times. They started at the Rose Bowl in 1998 and set off across the country. So once he finally left office, um, he did try to run a couple more times. He ran once against Betty Ireland, and I think he was 91, despite the fact that he had argued in his earlier days against um, you know, older people. Said so, so there should be a sunset clause on people. They should have to get out of office at a certain point. But Ken sort of thought that didn't apply to him. So he ran at 91, ran against Betty Ireland, trying to be Secretary of State again, and lost. Uh, and he took up, he'd always been a big environmentalist. He was really responsible for saving the New River as a recreational area. Um, and so he decided to fight against mountaintop removal mining. And this is a billboard that he erected all over the state saying, my name's Ken, I'm 96 and a fighter, and I'm fighting to save our mountains. At 94, he got arrested for trying to to block the entrance to a massive mine. And you were there at another march that he went on during the big break, the, uh, the, uh, the school that was, in, that was impacted by that, that slurry dam that was above it. Marsh, uh, Marsh Fork. Fork. Yeah, Marsh Fork. And uh, he was arrested, not then, but he was arrested at another time. Uh, 
they didn't put him in jail, and he was very disappointed with that because they thought he was too infirm to, to manage them. He was 94 when he did that. Um, so when he was um, 98, talk about not infirm, at 98 he got married for the very first time. And at 100, he signed a mortgage for a house. And I said, nothing says optimism like signing a 30-year mortgage <laughs> when you're 100 years old. But he, he had known Carol when he was, uh, and that's her behind him, he, when he was Secretary of State, and she was quite young. She's half his age, roughly. And, um, and he ran into her again at Larry Gibson's funeral. Larry Gibson was the, the king of anti-mountaintop removal mining. And when he died, Carol and Ken were both at that funeral. And they ran into each other again after many, many years and reconnected and they finally got married. Uh, my last story is about where they got married. Ken was a reluctant groom, let's say. He would talk about getting married and then he would back out. And he would talk about it again and say, well, let's don't do it now, let's do it in a couple of months. Let's, you know, like he had all the time in the world. And finally, he announced one day, he said, I want to get married. Let's go to Winchester. They lived in Romney by then. Let's go to Winchester and get married. And she said, okay. He said, you plan it, you set it up, and we'll go get married. Now, in Virginia, then, you, didn't, you, you don't have to wait three days. So they could just go get a license in the morning and get married that afternoon, which is how they planned it. They were going to get married at like 5 o'clock in the evening. And they had found a marriage officiant who was going to do the wedding. And they drove to Winchester, went in the courthouse, and, um, and they had to look at the marriage efficient because when they first called, Ken, Ken still thought he could get married in the courthouse, and he couldn't, so they had to find somebody who would do this. So they set it up, and then they drove to this guy's office and discovered that it wasn't handicapped accessible. And at the time, Ken was in a wheelchair. There was no way to get to this guy's office. So he, he came downstairs and he said, well, we could go to a park here in the city. And, and Ken said, no, I'm tired. I don't want to do that. By then, he's sitting in a truck, in their truck, which is a, like an Escalade thing, in a parking garage in Winchester, Virginia. And he says, why can't we just get me over right here? And Carol said, well, I guess we could. And the guy said, OK with me. So Carol stood outside by the passenger side window, Ken sat in the car, and the guy married him in the parking garage. <laughs> so um, he lived to 102, he, gave, he had several big birthday bashes, one here, one in Huntington in, uh, at, at his 100th birthday at Marshall. He had a party, he was always having a party in Romney for his birthdays. He had one at 99 and one at 101. And finally, he died at 102. So you can see why the name the Rebel in the Red Jeep is appropriate. Both him as a rebel, he never did anything the way anybody expected him to. And he fought against um, party politics and the machine. And anybody else he fought was not doing what he thought should be. The thing about Ken that I think is the most impressive as I really made him pretty human, but the thing that's the most so, so impressive about Ken was his total dedication to the art of politics and to working with whoever he could to make things happen for West Virginia. This business of, you know, the way we've got such a terrible split in government now would be such an anathema to Ken because he worked across the aisle all the time. And if somebody could help him, he didn't care whether they were Democrat or Republican. One of his champions um, who would speak highly of him and did uh, is Robert Dalton, who's a Republican. So it didn't matter to him what the party as long as you would team up with him and do what he thought was right, you were, you were okay with him. So, any questions? I'd be happy to answer. I'm sure I have several. One of them is, uh, was he involved in the MacArthur firing? Was he, yes. Did he do he research? Was. What, what yes, he did. He did the research and he wrote 
and actually Truman kind of put him on to what he wanted to do. He was looking for something that would uh, that would show that the MacArthur's um, um, not this is what I'm trying to think of insubordination. Mm -hmm. And so what Ken found was the way that Lincoln dealt with McClellan. And it was the same kind of thing. McClellan decided to go off and do what he thought was best and instead of doing what what Lincoln had told him to do. And that's exactly what MacArthur had done. And so that's what he used as his rationale for firing him. Ken found that information for him. Did he actually know FDR or did he? He met him once. Uh, he said that it was, it was like, you know, you're so awestruck. He said the first thing that you see is that, that uh, cigarette in the holder coming in the door and then the big grin. And you, by the time you've talked to him, you don't even realize that he's in a wheelchair. But he said, I wish I had spent more time. I was so awestruck that I wish I you know, had more occasion and spent more time to, 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 to be you know, closer to it, but he did do it. Did he regret running for governor in 76? And if he uh, had not done that, do you think he would have been in Congress for many, many years? I think he might have been you know, the Senator Bird of that. Uh, because <coughs> I, I think he could have just kept on running, you know, as long as, as, long as he um, kept doing what he was doing, I think he would have been fine. And yes, he regretted it. He said on more than one occasion to me it was the stupidest political mistake he ever made. The dumbest. And that he had never, he, Ken was not one to ask people's advice. And he certainly didn't on that score. Matter of fact, he didn't even tell Bobby Nelson he was doing it until after he'd done it. And by then, and Bobby Nelson was his, uh, his, Excuse me. He was Bobby's mentor, and Bobby worked for him for ten years in, con in as a congressional assistant and his office manager. And he ran the Lincoln Washington program and absolutely adores him. And uh, he would have been a shoe in to take Ken's spot. And by the time he found out that Ken was running for governor and dropping out of the race, he'd already committed to supporting Jim Sprouse. And so he, you know, being a loyal person, he didn't back off of that, and he stayed with Sprouse. And then, of course, Ken, after he didn't win the primary with Jay Rockefeller beating him, uh, even in the primary, he, he wanted to do a writing campaign to try and get back in Congress. He was sorry he made that mistake. And, um, but Ray Hall beat him. So, which I thought was, there was a bit of an irony to Ray Hall's losing to Evan Jenkins because it was the same sort of scenario and the same scenario that Ken had used sort of in beating Will Neal. You know, when you get to a certain point, there's always going to be somebody that's kind of creeping up behind you thinking that it's their turn now, not yours. And that happened to Will Neal, it happened to Ken, and it happened to, uh, to Nick Ray Hall. So it's a way of politics, I guess. Thank you all so much. I I appreciate it. Yeah, you have a, a couple of questions. One is when he got married at 98, uh, and I've heard, I don't know if it's urban legend or, or there's any truth to it, that part of the rationale was uh, an immigration status and people talked him into doing something to help somebody. No, she's <laughs> born in West Virginia, born in Romney. Okay. Did he have a source of, of revenue or funds or family money other than what he earned from public office? No. His book. His book. His book made lots of money. It was turned into a movie. Mm -hmm. Although he paid all, he got all this nothing. I think it was five hundred dollars for the movie. That's just dirt. Yeah. And but yeah, he's, that's really how he funded all of his campaigns was his own money. And besides that, he was cheap as they came. <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, that's, I mean, I'm not being funny about that. He truly, he, somebody asked me one time, did he wear clothes from Goodwill? And, and I had asked Carol that question. She said, no, he just wore the clothes he still wore when he was from, from the Truman era. 
he threw out clothes of his that were so old, I mean, literally, probably from the 50s. I mean, he never threw anything like that away. He lived in very tiny, almost um, spartan conditions in, in his apartments. He had a basement apartment over on Greenbrier Street. He didn't have a telephone. He bought you know, a television set about this big only because he needed to keep, he never stayed home. Uh, he had an apartment over top of, he never owned a hunt, ever. He had an apartment over top of Pancake Realty in Huntington until 2010, and that was his base of operations. But it was 90% full of his papers and books, not furniture. He had a bed and a couch and a, chair, and a table and a chair. He ate out every meal in his life, never cooked once. But he would eat, he would go to Shoney's and he would eat things like a plate of green beans. And then the next time it would be, did you ever eat with him? Mm -hmm. It would be something like orange slices. <laughs> I mean, and he was like, he was, he was real thin, played tennis all the time, never joined any, you know, social clubs or anything like that. I mean, he just didn't spend any money. And he had a decent salary. He had pensions from the army, you know, from Congress from, you know, he worked at the budget office in a number of different places and, and all those universities. And saved he just it. saved it. He saved it. And that's it. For excitement on Thursdays, when I first started here at the archives seven years ago, he used to come here on Thursday nights. And he said, right back here at that, at the uh, microfilm and the set and just read the newspapers mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, talk to uh, Jamie and whoever was sitting there mm -hmm. he'd, he'd talk to him and yeah. that was what he did on Thursday nights as he'd come that, that was seven years ago he, he remained mentally sharp oh gosh yes until <clears throat> until probably 101 maybe I trusted him to talk to tell me. Well, I spent four years with King, talking to him and having him tell me his stories and so forth. And I've got you know miles and miles of tape recordings of his conversations. And um, of course, he, he got very very deaf, so it was increasingly harder to talk to him. And on the telephone, it was almost impossible. He would have Carol get on the phone, and then he'd have Carol tell him what I said, and then you know. It's like a four-way conversation. <laughs> but um, his mind was so sharp that the archivist down at Marshall said that up until maybe 101, he would call down there and he'd say, Matt, I need um, the letter that Robert Byrd wrote me in uh, December of 1952. And I think it was like December 8th. Ken was right <laughs> now to look for this paper and he may be off by a day but that's it he was incredible incredible and um and sometimes you know he'd tell me the story more than once and so instead of stopping him i'd listen again because i always knew there was going to be another little gem in there that that he hadn't told me the first time around um but we went to key west together once and um just once was, Huh? Just once? Yes, just once. <laughs> yeah, I'll fess up to that. Just once, just once. Yeah. Uh, we went to a we went to a reenactment of the Bridget Ramagan in a little place. Richard went with me. This is my husband, Richard Cobb. Uh, we went with Ken and Carol to this place called Tiddyu, Pennsylvania. And every year they have a Bridget Ramagan celebration. And they invite Ken and had a couple of different times. He hadn't gone every year, but a couple of times. Reenactment. And it was a reenactment of the activities. So, so they had people, uh, reenactors in German uniforms, in American uniforms. You, and you didn't tell them about the Battle of the Bridge of Vermont. What was, you didn't mention what was happening there. Well, well, I will just say okay. So Okay. So, all right, the story of the Bridge of Ramagan is, if you don't know it, is that there, it was a bridge that was extremely important and it led eventually to Berlin. If you had to cross the Bridge of Ramagan in order to get to Berlin, the Germans were trying to blow it up 
because they didn't want the Americans to cross. And the Americans stopped them. It was already wired with explosives, and the Americans got on that bridge and disassembled all the explosives at great danger to themselves and everybody else, and saved that bridge, and the Americans crossed it when we got to Berlin. So they were doing this reenactment, and they marched through the cities, and they had jeeps, and it was really quite a deal. And they then had charges on this bridge, which is there at Tidhuge, and they blew it up. I mean, you know, a fake blow up thing. Well, of course, that was drama, but not accurate, you know. And the other thing that Ken immediately pointed out was not accurate, was that there were no women marching in the streets. <laughs> and it was the first thing he said, I thought, good grief, Ken. They brought you here, they honor you, and the first thing you do is criticize them. <laughs> Come on. But, but that was him. He wanted it absolutely right. Absolutely. Did he ever talk about the parallels of his political career and Jay Rockefeller's of t targeting a state where they could apply their wares? No, and you know, that's the other thing about Ken that I find really fascinating is that he was not given to introspection at all. I would ask him how he felt about something. For instance, one night we were talking about Truman and Hiroshima and the atomic bomb. And I said, Ken, how did you feel about that? He went right into great detail about how Truman had made the decision and why he thought it was right. Nothing, nothing about how he felt about it. He just was not, not given to doing it. Emotion. Yeah. yeah, he just didn't. And, and it's partly, I think, his upbringing. He came from a family that was extremely reticent to talk about themselves or the man they worked for. And that was part of the sort of the unspoken contract. Is he did not talk about Clarence Mackey or his family or his dealings or his house or anything. And as a matter of fact, his brother, his younger brother, uh, after his father, Clarence Mackey, and everybody else in the estate were dead, the son of one of the chauffeurs wrote a history of the estate. And Ken's brother was angry, just got furious because he had sort of told the secrets of the Mackey estate. It's a strange kind of um, behavior, I think, but that's the way he was. He didn't talk about himself. What about the, the, his two other brothers? What did what did they wind up doing? And did like how long did they live? Yeah. And one, his older brother, who was the very bright one, died at 22 in a mental institution on uh, Long Island. Wow. He is he was then called what they call it, dementia precox, which is what we call schizophrenia. And he had a breakdown in college. And they brought him home. And he seemed to get better, and then he began wandering the island and saying that people were after him and going into people's houses and so forth. And his parents hospitalized him in this horrible, horrible asylum called King's Hall, which I, if you go online and Google the history of it, it is, a, you know, it's a snake pit, it's a torture chamber, it was. And uh, he was beaten, his teeth were pulled, he lost weight, uh, he was combative and then guards were you know, fighting back and it was a really terrible, terrible death and um, his parents rarely went to sea, which is surprising, and Ken never did. Um, he, his mother went once and he attacked her, so she didn't go back. So he finally died at about 22 there in the hospital and probably of the, as a result of the brutality, not of the disease. His younger brother, went on to become um, his father's kind of heir in taking care of his own business. His father had other dealings in real estate and banking uh, other than just working for Mr. Mackey. So he was the president of the bank in Boston, and his son took over his real estate development information, I mean, his, 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 you know, his businesses. And he, he didn't die until 1979. He was successful, but he lived in even more for a long time. Thank you. You're welcome. You're welcome. It was my pleasure. Can we clap? Thank you. Yeah. <laughs>